While I was listening to these panels, I was reminded of uh, the rats in the walls at the end when De La Poor is uh, uh, regressing back from his uh, human state into this kind of, uh, to this barbarous state, right? And I was thinking of, of the, the first presentation, which is kind of like the graduate school version of Lovecraft, but mine is more of kind of Lovecraft one-on-one. So, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Lovecraft's uh, religion, uh, the, the influence of uh, Lovecraft's work on religious groups in a kind of summary way. And um, what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, what is Lovecraftian religion? And, um, and how I define that as any host of, uh, of the various modern paganisms that evoke Lovecraftian fictional elements in their rituals. Um, and has kind of referenced those in the pantheon. And I also want to be clear too, what, what my method is, as a historian of Christianity, I'm looking at um, Lovecraftian religions in that kind of perspective. So I'm looking at the historical significance of the Christian hermeneutical tradition within modern pagan traditions. Um, so it's kind of a comparative study in a sense. Um, and uh, looking at the relation between text and the understanding of what sacred is and the use of those texts and rituals. Uh, I also want to emphasize that Christians, of course, did not invent this or the use of texts and rituals. It goes back to the, the, the Jewish tradition and certainly we can see that in Islam, but also it goes back to the, the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition even before that. Um, also, I don't, don't want to argue the truth or falsity of any of Lovecraftian religions or Christianity for that matter. In fact, I put them on equal footing as a way to understand Lovecraftian religions as a modern religious phenomenon that has its influence, that has been influenced by many different tentacles, if you can say. Um, one of which is the Christian exegetical tradition, and that's something that I, I'm interested in too. So I guess the, when, if, if you want to know what the thesis is, and as everyone has said, this is a piece of a larger work that we're working on, so this is just a pastiche of a pastiche. Um, uh, basically, Lovecraftian religions have some similar <coughs> assumptions as do Christians about sacred texts, especially the Christian hermeneutical myth methods of dealing with the Old Testament, which Christians see have uh, many sacred truths and are acknowledged, acknowledged by the Old Testament writers. So in a sense, I'm looking at how did the Christians see the Old Testament and how they understood that. Right. And then how Lovecraftian religious traditions see Lovecraft in a similar way as being this unwitting oracle, someone who was not able to give the truth because people were not ready or he didn't really understand it. So we're going to get to that. Um, so, uh, let's see, I have a thing here, so it's more to do. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, in A Confession of Unfaith, published in 1922 in an amateur periodical, Liberal, Lovecraft writes of his last flickering, flickering of religious belief as a young child, which was, rather than the Protestant Christianity of his parents, the religion of ancient Greeks. And this is what he says in the quote is there. When about seven or eight, I was a genuine pagan, so intoxicated with the beauty of Greece that I acquired a half sincere belief in the old gods and nature spirits. I have in truth, I have in literal truth, built all altars to Pan, Apollo, and Athena, and have watched for dyads and satyrs and in the fields of dusk. Once I firmly thought I beheld some kind of silken creatures dancing under, under autumnal oaks, uh, a kind of religious experience as true in, 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 in its ways as the subjective ecstasies of the Christian. Lovecraft would later disavow uh, this and discover science um, and understand religion as a delusion of a primitive mind and openly embrace atheism. But this experience would prove an omen for the curious impact he would have on some of the more devoted followers. As Lovecraft would soon find out, some of the more mystically minded of his readers considered that he was in reality channeling even more powerful old gods than the silver creatures dancing in their autumnal oaks, but rather the powerful and frightening entities of the infamous Cthulhu mythos. For some, for some Lovecraft was um, admitting one religious experience while denying the reality of another. More important one, that the gods of the so-called Cthulhu mythos were in fact beings to uh, draw forth. Lovecraft, the self-proclaimed atheist and mechanical materialist, who spent most of his life ridiculing religion in many of his uh, letters, 
um, invented one of the most terrifying sort of pseudo mythologies, which is called the Stupid Cthulhu Mythos, which I'm sure everyone knows about here. Um, but uh, but I wanted to point out that in his lifetime, some people were already finding religious inspiration from Lovecraft's literary works. And here's the next one here. Okay, and here's the letter to Clark Ashton Smith. I think some of you are familiar with this one as well. Um, in 1933, uh, he was talking about the author William Lumley, who believed that Lovecraft and his literary pals, who used his pseudo mythology as genuine agents, or were genuine agents of unseen powers in, di in distributing hints too dark uh, and profound for human conception or comprehension. Lovecraft recognized this dilemma and has become an unwitting oracle with, a, with some humor. He says, Bill tells me that he has fully identified my Cthulhu and Nylar Hathoka uh, so that he can tell me more about him than I know myself. This irony was not lost on Lovecraft. In fact, it confirmed his views that people fall for some of the most absurd religious beliefs, even from his own pen. Uh, Lovecraft was a, um, for this, for Lovecraft, this was a portentous moment. Uh, Lovecraft's religious seed had been spilled. Uh, perhaps Lovecraftian's religion's uh, most in, in, important apostle was Kenneth Grant, <clears throat> which Justin referred to. Uh, Grant was heir to the esoteric religious organization Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, begun by Oliver Crowley. And, um, and uh, Grant cites Lovecraft many times in his work. And he praises Lovecraft for being ability to control his dreaming mind. Um, it is well known that Lovecraft gained inspiration for his stories from dreams. For Grant, Lovecraft received actual arcane knowledge in his dreams. Um, which was then expressed through the Cthulhu mythos. And Grant often equated Lovecraft's insights to his former master and saw Lovecraft as a visionary, even if Lovecraft would never have realized or admitted it himself. Grant was fascinated by the possibility of extraterrestrial dimensions in which powerful entities dwell, which attracted him to Lovecraft's fiction, but often ran him afoul of his former master and raised the scorn and eventual excommunication by the American leader. Uh, Carl the German. Uh, in his uh, popular work, Outside the Circle of Time, uh, Grant explains Lovecraft's great contribution to the occult lay in his demonstration, indirect as it may, be, it may have been, of the power so to control the dreaming mind that is capable of projections into other dimensions, and of discovering that the doors through which flow the form, inspiration, intuition, and vision, the genuine current of creative magical consciousness. You see, so, so Grant saw um, Lovecraft as that inspirational source within, within uh, Lovecraft's texts, his uh, fictional texts. Lovecraft unconsciously formulated the whole Cthulhu mythos from dreams from which he did not understand the source. For Grant, Lovecraft was channeling the same truth as Alistair Crowley, who was better adept to recognize his prophetic gifts and was able to take it from his metaphorical reality um, from which uh, Lovecraft reported raw in his fiction, and to make it into a workable uh, system in the Book of the Law. Lovecraft's supposedly fictional ne Necronomicon was uh, re revealed in his fiction, as revealed in his fiction, was a great work for Grant, a real work for Grant, and was filled with arcane truths. And here we see this quote here, um, in um, Outside the Circles of Time, Lovecraft is described as revealing truths about extra terrestrial forces and cosmic realms, but as Grant explains, conscious denial cannot hold its own against the world of subconscious certainty, which is evident in almost every line of Lovecraft's stories. His conscious utterance, utterances, his letters, his conversations with friends, in other words, the, the stuff that he talked about lovely, right, saying that, you know, basically taunting them, it needs to be completely discounted because as Grant says, um, Lovecraft had a split personality, um, and that's exposed in the, the difference between his letters and his fictional books. Uh, so with this uh, sweeping statement, Grant dismisses all of Lovecraft's statements about atheism as the ranting of a madman with dissociative identity disorder. Uh, Lovecraft, the religious prophet, is the only true Lovecraft for Grant. Although now considered to, to 
to by, by uh, by many to have written by uh, a Tino, the uh, Church of Satan's book, Satanic Rituals, also includes a number of uh, quotes from Lovecraft and references to Lovecraft. In fact, uh, there is a section called the Metaphysics of Lovecraft. So here is they.
or he was denying it. Right? The second thing that they all have in common is they all use the text of Lovecraft in some ways in their rituals or trance-inducing practices. In fact, and, and so what was hinging on here is a particular hermeneutical practice, right, of a, an interpretation of the text. Lovecraftian religions all emphasize Lovecraft's denial of his religious revelation, which reminds, reminds me of the Orthodox early Christian writers' insistence that the writers of the Old Testament, for example, Moses, Solomon, the prophets, were either unaware or unwilling to admit the true nature of the revelation until time was right. This was the basis for a Christian allegorical interpretation. The vagueness of Lovecraft's description on the various old ones leads, uh, lends itself to multiple understandings, one of which, as we have seen, is the religious revelation to those predisposed to find it. Like the story of Jonah, which is cited in the book of Matthew, Jonah's story of the uh, Jonah being swallowed by the fish coming out three days later is seen as a prediction of, of Christ's coming. So even though Jonah may not have been thinking about that, or may not have known that that was what his whole experience was about, that's really what it really meant. Um, also we see in Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18, where it explains that Moses, who was thought to have written the Hebrew Scriptures, knew that the Jews were not ready for true revelation, so Moses put a veil over, and this is a quote from the put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at the end of what was fading away. Moses knew that their minds had become closed, for the same veil is there to this very day. Okay, so a denial of the, the source of these quotes, uh, that goes back to the Old Testament, similar in some ways to how the uh, Lovecraftian uh, practitioners looked toward Lovecraft, who said, I was not being wrong. I said, nothing to do with it. So it's, it's that hermeneutical assumption there. And this underlies every adherent, of, I think, of these Lovecraftian religions. For early Christians, it was the Holy Spirit that transmitted the story to the Old Testament writer, who may not have fully understand the Revelation, which was oftentimes transmitted in dreams. Adherents of Lovecraftian religions often cite inspiration from their prophet through dreams as well. In both Christianity and Lovecraftian religions, the method for justifying revelatory texts are primarily exegetical in nature. But Lovecraftian religions, religious exegetes, also invert that Christian hermeneutical mood by making the text which Lovecraft claimed to have used as a means to explore his, his uh, atheistic cosmicism, literally, and thus making the religious meaning out of the elements for Lovecraft's fiction. So in other words, that uh, even though the uh, Christians would look at you know, the Hebrew Bible allegorically, the Lovecraftian religion, religious tradition, looks at Lovecraft literally. See how that is. So it's kind of an inversion. The influence of the Christian hermeneutical tradition in finding hidden meanings in the Old Testament that are lost, even to the authors, at least tonight, can be felt in the authors and practitioners of the Lovecraftian traditions, as we have some examples. So, what does the future hold for Lovecraftian religions? This is my concluding paragraph. Uh, with the popularity of the works of Lovecraft on the rise, um, Lovecraftian religions, I think, are too poised to proliferate. Right? There's, they're continuing to grow. The fact that we're having this conference now with all of us here shows us the popularity of Lovecraft and Lovecraftian religions will rise with that, I'm certain. Uh, and, and, and this is particularly true with the technological revolution of the internet. And that has also helped, I think, Lovecraft. The web allows for freedom of thought and exchange of ideas beyond anything in world history. And, this is, and with this new reality, seekers of religious truth will find them in many forms even in the guise of the mechanical materialist from Providence. Lovecraft prophesied this to be so in his lifetime. As it was in the beginning when Lovecraft the prophet walked the earth, so it shall be in the future as Lovecraftian religions continue to spread the bad news of the old ones and their impending return when the stars are right.